So what about fighting in Islam? Well, we know Islam being a practical religion, it's a deen. It's not a religion, it's a world view. It's a comprehensive way of life. It realizes that humans actually fight and engage in war. It, that's what it realizes. I mean, Allah Azzawajal knows humanity better than humanity knows itself. However, but Islam sets rules for war, which are to be followed if Muslims go to war. Now, here's some of the rules of war. And the Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his articulation of the rules of war predated and preceded the th things like the Geneva Convention. So Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was years ahead of his time because we believe he was given divine revelation. So some of these rules include no killing of innocent people, no killing of women and children, no burning of cups and trees, only fight those that fight you and no wanton destruction. This is why Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa first successor and is considered to have been his closest companion. He said, when the armies were ready to go out, he said, stop, O people, that I may give you 10 rules for your guidance in the battlefield. Do not commit treachery or deviate from the right path. You must not mutilate dead bodies, neither, neither kill a child nor a woman nor an aged man. Bring no harm to the trees, no burn them with fire, especially those which are fruitful. Slay not any of the enemy's flock save for your food. You are likely to pass people who have devoted their lives to monastic or humanitarian services. Leave them alone. And this is exactly what Islam talks about when we're saying when we want to engage in fighting after diplomacy fails. We have these specific rules. I mean, we didn't come up with the term collateral damage. It's a very technical cold term, which means the killing of innocents. That's what it means. Oh, it was an inevitable death because we had to kill the majority evil people, but you know, some innocents had to die. That's what collateral damage is. We, didn't, we don't invent terms like this. Every innocent person is a person that should be mourned and we should regret. So let me just walk through some of the rights concerning the battlefield and combatants. Now first and foremost we have a very general principle in the Quran in chapter 5 verse 32 when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever kills a human being without any reason, like a manslaughter or corruption of the earth, it is as though he has killed the whole of mankind. So what it tells us now that Allah Azza wa is telling us that to kill someone, it has to be via a due process, via law, or via just reasons. This is why Allah in the Quran in chapter 6 verses 151, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do not kill a soul which Allah has made sacred except through due process of law. And this is why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, The greatest sins are to associate something with God, shirk and to kill human beings. Now, Im immediately after the verse of the Holy Quran, of the Noble Quran, which was mentioned in the connection of the right to life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and whoever saves a life, it is as though he has saved the lives of all of mankind. So we see these values from the Quran and Sunnah really being strong about killing innocents and killing in an unjust way. Following from this, we also have the rights of combatants. For example, we're not allowed to torture and we're not allowed to torture with fire as well. In the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that can be found in Abu Dawood, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, punishment by fire does not behave anyone except the master of the fire, Allah Azza wa Jal. Also we have protection of the wounded. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do not attack a wounded person. Also, we have that prisoners of wars should not be slain. The Prophet ﷺ was very clear and he said, no prisoner of war should be put to the sword. Also, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said, no one should be tied to be killed. He said, rather, the narration goes that the Prophet ﷺ has prohi prohibited the killing of anyone who is tied or is in captivity. Also, we have teachings concerning the looting and the destruction in the enemy's country. It's been narrated in the hadith in Al-Bukhari and Abu Dawood. That the Prophet ﷺ said, The Prophet has prohibited the believers 
from loot and plunder. And in another hadith in Abu Dawood, the Prophet said, the loot is no more lawful than the pig. So it's these prohibitions. Obviously, we also believe in the sanctity of a dead body. In a hadith that could be found in Al-Bukhari and Abu Dawood, the Prophet said, the Prophet has prohibited us from mutilating the corpses of the enemies. Also, we believe in returning the corpses to the enemy. There was a time when the unbelievers presented 10,000 dinars to the Prophet and requested that the dead body of the fallen warrior may be handed over them. And the Prophet replied, I do not sell dead bodies. You can take away the corpse of your fallen comrade. And also we believe in the prohibition of the breach of treaties when we're engaged in war. If we have a treaty with someone, we cannot breach any treaty. Islam has strictly prohibited this. Now one of the instructions that the Prophet ﷺ gave to the Muslim warriors, if you like, when he was sending them to the battlefield, he said, do not be guilty of the breach of faith or the breach of treaties.